Hello and welcome to our CMO panel hosted by the CIM Greater London Region. My name is Chris Daly and I'm the Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute of Marketing and today we'll be discussing with our panel of leading CMOs why it's crucial to invest in technology and skills to succeed in a post-COVID world. If one thing is for certain, the pace of change and the need for lifelong development has never been more prominent. The catalyst for today's event is CIM's CMO 50 report, which explores the views of 50 of the UK's leading marketers from business, the third sector, and the agency world. It uncovers how confident CMOs and marketing directors feel about the future, together with the big issues that are keeping them awake at night. In particular, we will discuss three key issues highlighted in the report. First being how COVID-19 has accelerated digital transformation. The second being what marketers must do to keep up with technology and innovations. And thirdly, how marketers are bridging the digital skills gap to succeed in a post-COVID world. It's my great pleasure to introduce our host for the day, Moki Khan, who is chair of the CIM Greater London Region. Moki, over to you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to everyone for joining today's panel discussion. It's great to see so many of you have tuned in. Uh, we have a lot to fit in before two o'clock. Just to remind everyone, this session is being recorded and will be available on CIM um, YouTube channel. Just to give everybody a background and context, over the last past couple of years, the pandemic has taken, has shaken all industries in an unprecedented way. Digital transformation has accelerated beyond expectations and inspiring CMOs were at the helm at many companies as they innovated to keep abreast of these changes. Today, we have brought together leading and high profile CMOs to discuss some of the key trends they have seen and the technology and the digital skills that they are investing to stay competitive. I really want to encourage you to submit questions, uh, which I'll be submitting to the panelists towards the end of the session. You can do this by using the question mark icon on your screen. If you're watching it on a laptop, you find this on the right hand side of your screen or on the top or bottom if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. I really want this session to be interactive, interactive so please do send in your questions and our panelists are waiting for them. I have great privilege in introducing our excellent panel and I'm delighted to welcome Christoph Wormann, CMO with Deutsche Bank. Hello, Christoph. Ruth Hello. Bowen, uh, CMO of Avenard. Hi, Ruth. Hi. Uh, Paul Bolt, CMO, CMO of Microsoft UK. Hi, Paul. Hey, good afternoon, and, everyone. And Rika Wickerman Brun, of Managing Director of MRM, who are part of McCann's. So welcome, everyone. It's really great to see you, and thank you for taking your time out of such of your busy schedule and joining us today. So let's start. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to spend 10 to 15 minutes on each topic. And my role is obviously to moderate, but also be timekeeper. So the, the first topic we'll discuss is digital trends. Um, and the first question we have is what digital trends have emerged in your industry over the, over the last couple of years? So Christoph, would you like to uh, kick start on this one? Thank you very much, Moki. And uh, yes, uh, just by way of explanation, I'm the CMO of Deutsche Bank's corporate bank who deals with business to business clients, so corporates and institutional clients, not retail clients. But it's interesting uh, that we observe, and I'm sure many of uh, the listeners and viewers um, do the same, that there is a merging trend between B2B marketing and B2C marketing in terms of what uh, audiences are expecting. And that's exactly what we've seen over the last years and particularly amplified via the pandemic where, where in the past uh, very very often a corporate website was basically sort of uh, just a you know, showcase of uh, product capabilities and it wasn't really actively using uh, or used as a uh, marketing funnel workhorse so to say that has completely changed um, in line with also an emphasis on email marketing and an, an emergence of the whole social media channel. So uh, when we're also looking at, at, at trends that um, uh, Gartner has, has, has observed, you know, where, where the channel allocation um, ha has, been, has been moving, 72% uh, 
uh, of uh, the marketing uh, channel allocations really gone into that digital channel route, website, email, mobile, and then you know compounded by uh, digital ads and search ads uh, and, and and social and SEO, and that's actually what we what we see that uh, that kind of um, engaging with your audiences compared to in the past purely sending and positioning is much more important than ever before. Uh, thank you, Christoph. What are other panelists' views on this? I want to. I think you're absolutely like uh, right, Christoph, and obviously we see that a lot in the agency as well. Um, I think it's also. I think it's not only channels, but I feel you know the audiences have broadened as well. You know, it's a, you know you're not just one person. Yeah, so you know a grandmom can be a gamer. You know, we're using information, we're using gaming to provide information. In Brazil, they use gaming to um, sort of, you know, um, to really get push on the vaccines. You know, a um, 40-year-old mother of a 16-year-old is also a TikTok user, you know, and, and a B2B um, marketing manager is also an Instagrammer. You know, so I think the audiences in conjunction with what you just said have broadened as well, which I think is, is a really interesting thing that's come out of the pandemic as well that we need to accelerate and, and move towards as well. Thank you, Rika. Ruth, what are your views on this? Yeah, I think I build on what, what, what Rika just said, you know, just the pandemic has, has meant that everybody's had to digitise faster than they were before. And I think whether it was age groups that were more, you know, operating online more than others, you know, if I take an example of, you know, my mother's in her 70s, she'd never done online banking until the banks weren't open. And so she was forced to be able to do more things online than she'd ever done before. Um, but also we're, we're in the B2B space and, and only operating B2B. We've seen so many of our clients that perhaps have been in more traditional industries that weren't born in the digital age digitized because of the pandemic. Um, so whether that's education, healthcare, um, parts of financial services um, that perhaps were were slower in terms of adopting digital have been forced to digitize and are actually now rethinking um, how they operate differently because of this forced digitization. And that's both, you know, the, their organization as a whole, but also roles within that organization. So I think that's just created a whole level of digital literacy um, that we've not seen before. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing um, in terms of just some of the risks that that presents from a cyber security perspective, you know, um, a, a, across the board. So we're definitely seeing that as well from, you know, both an individual level, but also a, a, an industry level. I'd also like to quickly jump in, uh, uh, sorry to, uh, to jump in because, you know, no, we, please, should, please, we should please, make please, this a sort of a live yeah. debate. Um, um, I, I think it's important at this point in time also to uh, think about what uh, Ruth and, and Ricky just said. When when you're a classical marketeer and you know your idea springs into your head straight away, you know persona models. I, I think you all have seen on social media this this funny comparison of two pictures. You know that person that is born in uh, 1940 lives in a castle and is a very famous person, and you know two persons like that. One was Prince Charles and one was Ozzy Osbourne. So forget about that. You know, persona-based marketing. Ricky just said, uh, you know, a grandma can be a gamer. So we have to also, next to observing the channel explosion, we have to leave our mind prison of, you know, bankers like me always tie, wear, wear ties. No, they don't. <laughs> and and that's exactly what we need to um, uh, observe in marketing next to the whole technology and budget uh, challenge. So it's. It requires a, a complete different set of skills, experience, and mixture in the team, but we are definitely elaborating on that later. Uh, thank you, Christoph. And I, I just want to say to the rest of the panelists, if there's anything that you want to come in or you want to challenge what someone else said, please do step in. As Christoph said, we want this to be a, yeah. a, a discussion. So, so Paul, um, obviously, you're you know, CMO of Microsoft, obviously technology-led. What have you seen in, 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 in the last couple of years? Yeah, I think, I mean, firstly, I think the world has indelibly changed. And I think a lot of what the panelists are saying is like the rules, the rules have shifted. The world is different. Um, I think the biggest trends that I've seen are the level of expectation 
of our customers. So I'm, I'm talking through the B2B lens at, at Microsoft. So thank you to the B2C marketeers who have created incredibly high standards over the years. Uh, that's now bled fully through into B2B. And so the expectations in terms of how our customers engage with us, those expectations are, are higher than ever. Um, and I think probably in our first earnings call after the pande pandemic, I think our CFO says something along the lines of we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in the last two months. Um, and I think the other really interesting trend to come out of it is, you know, some businesses were prepared and ready and fit and good to go into this environment. Others weren't and still aren't. And so I think you see there's a lot of opportunity at the moment as well for market disruption and business model disruption. Um, you know, I, I mean, who, uh, you know, great example, you know, a year or two years ago, I think a lot of people would have thought, you know, twice about buying a car online through an organization you know, they've never seen before. But, you know, there's an example of an organization that's come in and thought, well, in, in the current climate, here's an opportunity for me to come in and really shake up how people think about sourcing and, and buying cars. So there's a lot of disruption in the market. And I think some organizations are reimagining and rethinking their operating models and will pivot themselves beautifully for the opportunity that's ahead. And by the way, I'm very optimistic about, about the future. I think post-vaccine, you know, post-Brexit, um, we have to be optimistic because I think all the corporations and maybe public sector and academic institutes on, you know, on this call, I think we're, we've got to be part of the, 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 the solution, not part of the problem as, as the economy you know, rebuilds, as we look at building a fairer, and more equitable economy. And everything we're talking about now, the skills, the technology, the disruption, really enable us to kind of reimagine what the UK could look like. And I think that's probably one of the most exciting parts. Not so much that everything I agree with, with, with what's been said. I just think there's a much bigger opportunity uh, for us to reimagine and reinvent um, what the UK looks like. And I think you know, technology and skills, and I know we'll continue talking about those, are absolutely central uh, to us being you know, competitive um, as an economy, investable you know, as an economy, uh, and to you know, rightfully earn a place on the global stage as an economy. So there's this ginormous movement underneath these kind of marketing trends we're talking to, which as a marketeer as well, I'm really excited about how we think about embracing them uh, and how you know, the organizations we, we work for, as I say, are, are part, of the, part of the solution, not part of the problem as we, uh, as we you know, adjust to, a, uh, you'll say, an indelibly changed uh, United Kingdom. And you know, I think you speak to many people who would say the biggest driver of digital transformation in their business has been COVID, not their CMO, not their CDO. And so like, it's, it's, been, it's been huge. And I think there's a lot of dust still to settle, but there's an amazing opportunity for us, uh, you know, CMOs as, as, and, and, and as business leaders to really think about how we, um, you know, say how, how we become part of the solution, how we embrace the opportunity, um, you know, that, that's been presented in the global and the UK economy, because that, that bit's vast. I'm kind of, I'm less interested in the tactics. I'm kind of more interested right now around how, you know, we step into a position um, where we're seen as, as part of the part of the solution as a, as as you know somebody who's invested in the UK as a, as a trusted organisation. I think there's something really interesting in there. It's not about how do we go to market. It's about there's a chance for the right organisations to step forward, step in, be held accountable, and be trusted uh, within the UK. I think that's probably the most exciting trend that's emerged from this. Uh, so thank you, Paul. Um, a couple of you already, you know, you used the term expectation. So I, I think the next question for me to ask you is, you know, it, or you're all from different sectors, which is great. So do you think within marketing has 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 meted their ex expectations in certainly in your in your sector? And what has pandemic actually done to accelerate the transformation and technology? So who would like to take that? Well, I can start if you like, uh, because. Um, Whenever I have the opportunity to speak to very valuable audiences like today's audience, um, I try to find that, find that corner that we marketeers do not have to spend half of our life justifying our existence and succumbing to KPIs and whether we are uh, you know, needed in the board or not. To be honest, marketeers are are more needed than ever before. And the pandemic has showed this very clearly. I'll give you an example. In my industry, I've, um, I've started a couple of years ago with you know, what is now a solid trend of content marketing. I insourced journalists and started to create content myself as opposed to having sponsored content statements written by some people who don't understand our industry. And that helped me that when the pandemic hit, the very next day, Clients were expecting us to educate them on, you know, how is treasury changing? 
What are the priorities? How do you manage your supply chains? I'll give you another example. When the unfortunate invasion of Russia and the Ukraine happened, uh, that was on a Friday night. On a Sunday night, we had a complete website up and running that advised clients on what is the nature of sanctions? What have you, do you have to do with your payments? What happens when you have outstanding uh, uh, business with, with, with counterparts in Ukraine? This was even before any German official or other country official website uh, published this. And this responsiveness is enabled by a technology, but also by a team that has the capability and the content creation uh, capability. So to answer the question about marketing's relevance, if not now, whenever can we better show that we are not um, push vehicles of corporate brand messages and, and getting products out of the door? That's the job of sales. They have to get rid of what, we, what you have. Marketing is the one that shows the competence that gives the gift of giving information and, uh, and, and, and context so that a client uh, can decide where they go. Because it's ultimately whether it's B2C or B2B, it's a people's business. And human marketing is what will drive the future. Uh, and we as marketeers, therefore, shouldn't spend our time in justifying which KPIs are relevant or not. Of course, you have to have material KPIs in terms of showing whether re engagement hits any or strikes any cause or not. But that for me is like, yeah, I mean, a car has four wheels. Why do I still question this? Just move on and get into a different stage of discussion. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, Rika, I'd like to bring you in here because obviously you're from the agency world. So what Crystal was saying, you know, you know, they were very ready, very quick and, and could set up the website and, and information there. What's it been like on the agency side? Well, I, 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 so I, I, there are two things I really want to pull out from what you said, Christoph, that I think are um, super relevant. I think one is, I think you're right. Marketing should be seen as a service to human beings, yeah? Not only as things to go through. It was a funnel. It is now a very complex, you know, map of uh, customer experience touch points. But if we start looking at it, and this is definitely, you know, from an agency point of view, where we get the best best work out as well. If we start looking at it as marketing is a real service to humans, yeah, to human beings, to different kinds of people that has different needs, even more so today because they are more like we talked about more than one person. I love that. I also think one thing that I fear is coming up, not just of the we, you know, not just the pandemic, but definitely accelerated by the pandemic. But you mentioned the war and the situation in Ukraine as well is. Oh my God, it's really taught us to be much more responsive, much faster. From an agency side, we have probably sat and kind of gone to our clients, do things faster, do it better, you know, accelerate your digital transformation, et cetera. I think that, <laughs> Paul's laughing. I think, you know, I think it's given us a push, which is great. It's given us as an agency as well to be taught us that we can and given confidence in us that we can be responsive it works yeah we can be agile don't be too worried about the silos and everything so so i think it's done that and in that it's definitely made us more robust to deal with change i think we have tried to plan for change we always talk about you know you know change is coming change is here we've experienced we're quite fortunate in many ways that we have actually experienced very rapid changes and we have dealt with them and they've taught us robustness and resilience and speed and i think that's one of the two things or one of the things that have come beautifully out of of the of the past two years uh, thank you for that um, i'm obviously one of them we want to the uh, next part which is technology but just before i do um one of the things that people are asking is what digital trends are do you predict what will happen in the future so what are the trends that you see coming forwards. Uh, Paul, over to you on that one. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're going to talk forward looking. I think before we do, I just, you know, say to everyone, just don't forget the basics, you know, modernize your data estate, get it in a central data lake, and then you can apply all the amazing cool tools and technology like AI and you know, cognitive services and machine learning on top of it. But so, so don't, you know, if we're going to talk future, there's still a lot of work to do today in most organizations that I, that I go to speak to where, 
you know, uh, unless you've got great data, it's very, very hard to leverage cognitive services, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and a lot of the tools that we, we use here. We went through a very, very painful modernization of our data estate. So I'll talk about the future, but everyone, great data strategy, understand your data strategy. And then you can really exercise the value of some of the tools that I'm, I'm referring to. Because I think the one that probably is top of mind for a lot of people is the metaverse. Um, yeah. And, yes. and, and, and the role the metaverse has, has to play. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting when you think about it through a B2C uh, or, or, or a B2B perspective, the context in which metaverse, um, you know, can and, and, and I believe will, you know, shape the way we, we kind of, the way, the way we socialize, the way we play and the way, the way we work. Clearly, you know, from my perspective, we've, we've demoed a lot of our metaverse technology through Microsoft Teams. Um, and I see a very clear use case um, for you know metaverse um, as a collaboration platform um, as a platform to get teams together as a platform to um, you know extract more from one another because as good as digital is by the way um, you know and I, I was with Rika and Hadim the other week there's a lot that digital also doesn't do well um, there are certain topics and scenarios where uh, you just need to be in the room it's much easier you can get through much more work as human beings but I think metaverse is a really good bridge between the two. I always remind everyone, by the way, you know, the, the, you know, Minecraft is a metaverse. It's a very blocky metaverse, right? Everyone's made of squares, but you've got to create your own identity and your own character to go in and build and, and, and participate uh, in, in there as well. So I can genuinely see a, a really good use case for it in terms of business context. I think there's an existing great use case in the world of gaming in the shape of, in the shape of Minecraft. I won't be going to the pub to meet my friends in the metaverse. I think I'll still do that as a human being. I think that's gonna be a much more enjoyable experience, but I think defining the use cases for metaverse and how we think about metaverse as marketers is like fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, metaverse is an interesting area. And uh, so, so, so Christoph and, and, and Ruth, what are your thoughts on the metaverse? Is that something that you would, you would think that other brands and companies should, should be thinking about now? I, I, I let Ruth uh, respond because I, I, I'd like to be a bit contra controversial here. So maybe Ruth, oh, do you okay. got any, anything Ruth, to say? Ruth, Ruth, to you first. Yeah, do you know, I, I feel like we're very much on the cusp of the next generation of how we interact in the digital space. You know, if you think we had the web 20 years ago, then we had social media 10 years ago, and it feels like this next de decade, the thing that's coming for all of us as marketers to get our heads around is the metaverse. And at the moment, you know, I've spent some time in the metaverse. It does feel a little bit clunky. You know, it does feel like it's very much the, the, the realm of the early adopters in terms of that adoption curve. But the pace of transformation, you know, that Paul talked about is speeding up. We know that as marketers. So we've got to figure it out, haven't we? Otherwise, we're going to miss, miss that curve. And I think like anything, it's figuring out what's relevant today for us. And everything we talked about, grannies on TikTok, you know, there are going to be some early adopters that are the early adopters of these new channels. And, and if we're not there and we're not relevant, we're going to miss those customers. So thinking about how do we pilot, trial, show up, experiment, experiment with our customers. You know, we've all become much more digitally um, native through the pandemic. So how do we co-create and co-innovate with, with our customers that are in that space as well? But then what is that mainstream proposition for for all of us and how do we use that to do things differently you know i think i love that last discussion around you know what what does this new world mean for us as a marketing community and i think marketers are optimistic we are the voice of the client we are creative and we are one of the functions in our business that get to think about the future beyond this quarter and this financial year and I think we have to embrace these new technologies and particularly these new engagement channels like the metaverse to take our organizations into that future. Now, I'm in my late 40s. And so generally, I am not the right age group to take our organization in the right way into the metaverse. So certainly in Avenard, we've put a whole bunch of people that are naturally experimenting in new channels to figure out how should we occupy the metaverse and what do we do first? So we've got a kind of and it's terrible, it's de definitely not inclusive of me, but younger group or people that are really interested naturally in the metaverse actually doing doing some pilots for us in that space because it's their passion really. 
and, and that is just one thing I know Paul you, you brought up the metaverse but there's also some really cool stuff happening in terms of marketing tech at the moment around artificial intelligence just making us all smarter faster you know we, we using data we will come on to that uh, in terms of technology in certain sectors. So, Christoph, uh, let me hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, the reason why I want to be contro controversial a bit is, uh, you know, everyone agrees, and I do agree with Paul and Ruth, that as a marketeer, you need to step into new frontiers and you need to be explorative and, and stuff. And, and I compare the metaverse a little bit like... Uh, what the the whole e trend was at the end of the nineties? You, you you put an e in front of any any product because it was internet and it was oh cool and you got investors and, and then suddenly the bubble burst and then we had a sort of uh, real use case testing of the internet and this is where we are today. So yes, it's here to stay for collaborative purposes as well. But I have absolute uh, uh, experience to share straight away because when the pandemic hit, of course we said. Every big conference of this world had to move into the digital space. So you either do a big Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or a webinar and what not. So we tried to push the boundaries and we teamed up with a metaverse company. And on the occasion of one big industry conference, we had a festival of finance and we invited them to the metaverse. And our guests, and remember, you know, not young 18 year old but middle uh, uh, uh mid mid-year mid individuals on the client side suddenly found themselves jumping as an avatar into a 3d conference space where they saw the conference stand that we usually had at the big uh, exhibitions in 3d and i fully fully can say the excitement was amazing the fact that you could talk to somebody you could change your avatar but there's a difference between the excitement of doing something for the first time and technology works and it's okay and it's super, and then move from that novelty factor into a BAU factor. Okay, shall we do this now, every conference with avatars? And I would hasten to say, let's first of all fix things in the 3D world and make it very well happen and then replicate and learn in the meantime what the metaverse uh, will mean for you what specific business need it has so that you do not fall into this place like I've got a creative market here who actually does really not know what we you know what we are sweating in front of uh, our clients and you know what what we need and he comes with ideas yes it's good to inspire but then to find out what's the relevance for collaboration as Paul said big tick absolutely big tech you can really see people hand over documents in the virtual space anyone who would like to see this we have a channel called Expedition Finance, where we just had a four, uh, five minutes clip uh, that is going to be aired soon. And it's not a Deutsche Bank product push, it's exactly that industry engagement where we have uh, uh, someone who's just exploring these things. So it's absolutely important, but let me come back to the question of one of the audience in terms of the digital trends. I think when we are, when we are using technology better and better, then we can come to contextual marketing so that I know so much about our clients, where they're in the journey. And in my case, we've got very complex buying journeys that sometimes last up to 18 months with so many different um, uh, uh, people involved. So you cannot just say, here's a hot lead, hello sales, please take it and you know, close it. It's the engagement. And knowing contextually where someone is backed by the data that you have and the access uh, you have, that's important. And we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking all the big firms have sussed it out. And if you're sitting in a small mid cap firm, God, you poor marketeer, you are at the end of your tether. Not at all, because if you're in a smaller company, you can make changes far quicker and test things far quicker. Whilst when you're in a big organization and in a, you know, in, in a regulated organization like, like, like mine, where technology progress has to jump through so many hurdles. So see this as an incremental journey of where do you want to be? How relevant do you want to be contextual before you then add other stuff to your tech and marketing delivery stack? Uh, thank you, Christoph. We, we've sort of you know, wandered into technology, which, which is great. And uh, Ruth, you sort of touched upon AI. Uh, I just want uh, sort of a concise um, 
you know, thoughts from each of the panelists, just in terms of in your particular industry, uh, what new, new technologies do you think are going to, going to be prominent in your in your field? So if I go to Ruth first. Um, artificial intelligence, certainly for us, you know, it's just making um, marketing faster and better um, without the need for us to dramatically increase headcount and skills to, to, to be honest with you. There's some really cool marketing technologies now that underpin each of our marketing tech stacks. Um, but it's interesting, I, I just think there's so much now in the MarTech space that you can become too, it, it's just, it, it can become too cluttered that you lose sight of actually what's important, which is your customer and how you help your customer. And I think the, as much as we as marketers stay connected to What's the problem that we're trying to solve with our customer and how are we staying deeply relevant to that, that we are front of mind for our customer so that they know why we're here and how we can help and that when they're ready to engage, that we're really easy to engage with. So those kind of fundamentals of marketing, I think, have stayed the same, irrespective of channel divergence. Um, I think one of the one of the things I see is there's so much technology now to enable us to do that. It can some, we can sometimes lose sight of actually that objective. The one thing that I, I see really helping us is artificial intelligence in joining the dots between the various platforms that, that we use, not just in marketing, but actually in how all of our businesses operate. So sales, delivery, service. Uh, th 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 thank you, Ruth. Just before I go to, to Rika, there's a lot, obviously a lot of questions coming in. And just on that AI, one of the questions that uh, I've seen is, um, will AI re replace marketeers? <laughs> um, I think it will it will replace some roles or yeah. some parts of roles, some of the tasks that we do. And generally, it's the tasks that you know should be automated, frankly, it's bringing us up to do some of the more emotive or strategic elements of our job. Someone said no. Was that was that you, Christoph? Yeah, because um, in agreement with Ruth, uh, I don't see the value of marketeers that. Uh, you know, you, you, you're preparing campaigns where you lead people through the funnel and you, you're writing every, you know, email individually. So, of course, AI and machine learning is something for, for masses or for big campaigns that you've got programmatic uh, uh, ways of, of leading through some steps. But the reason why I'm violently disagreeing is also in terms of our professionals, marketers. Good marketers can never be replaced by uh, automation, process automation or AI they will be assisted. And creativity in terms of the engagement um, is that you need as a marketeer to sufficiently know your industry and your business, of course, that in the way you respond is, as I said, is an engagement of an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing conversation. I, I mentioned in uh, a couple of minutes ago, you know, our response to the war. There, there's no script say, oh, what happens when, you know, one country invades the other, this is what you have to do. You have the technology at your fingertips, but then you have to very quickly ask yourself, what keeps our clients awake at night? What do we have to do you know, first? And how do we update? How do we communicate? Do we actually, you know, swamp people with information or do we do this like you season a good dish, you know, in the right proportion? Because that was also one of the observations through the pandemic. Yeah, of course, opening rates and clicks with rates and emails uh, went first up, then down. Why did they went down? Because you know more people were fighting for the same pie, i.e., attention pie uh, of of the audiences. So that kind of experience, how you use technology to make a meaningful engagement, that's the clue. What a good marketeer has to do so i'm very happy also later on to, to talk about you know what kind of marketers do we need uh, thank you I, 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 i'm uh, i'm conscious of time so i'll go to rika then i'll go to then i'll go to paul uh rika your, your thoughts um in terms of the technology in your in, in, in your sector i think it's interesting because i obviously work in the creative space as well right you know so obviously lots of um lots of what we do um results in a creative output of some kind um and i think when we talk about ai i think you know i think for us as a creative industry and the creative agency as well not only that but you know 
I think it can enable, it can help speed, it can complement. I don't think, I hope it will never replace the critical thinking we have as humans, the obligation we have to be critical thinkers and question things. I hope we won't do that. I hope it will complement us. I also think from a creative point of view, we have to be emotive. Um, still creatively and be humanly oriented um, and I hope that AI is not going to take that away from us you know I think that we will still have to have the human and emotive element in ideation and creation I think humans respond, respond to emotion and I think that's our obligation so I hope it will complement us from speed fast game is a good game and all of that and take all of the boring stuff away from us but I will not lose the critical thinking and the emotive creative output that also drives us as marketeers and as human beings. Well, thank you. Uh, Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll keep it short if, if, if it's a bit tight on time. I think, you know, the you know, technology augmenting human capability is where I see the best outcomes in my team uh, every time. And I think that that's always going to be the way. With regards to you know, AI and automation replacing roles, it will replace roles all across every business over the next five, 10 years. But, you know, it's kind of it's no different to, you know, what happened to all the horse and cart drivers when mechanization of taxis arrived in London, they retrained. And so we'll talk about skills again later on. There is a sizable skills gap. Um, and we've seen it before as technologies like mechanization replaced horse and cart. We've seen huge waves of skill sets displaced in, in in the past. There are many examples over the over the over the centuries, um, and you know, post-industrial revolution, many many examples. But these people reskill, these people retrain, uh, and we've got a similar um, uh, piece of work to do as marketeers. Uh, I think we've got a similar piece of work to do, you know, broadly across our organisation. So I think it augments humans. That's the very best outcomes I see. Uh, and will people be displaced? Yes. Will they need to learn new skills? to be relevant to the economy? Yes. No, thank you, Paul. A, a lot of people are asking uh, about investment and, and, and the return. So how do you ensure return on your MarTech in, uh, investment? So, uh, Paul, would you go answer this one or get your insight on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you said to me, hey, show me your marketing scorecard and, you know, and KPIs, there's a thousand leading and leading and lagging indicators that we we track as a business. Um, but fundamentally, uh, one of the things I would in, encourage you all to do is really think about how you simplify your impact. So there are three numbers I speak to my business about, uh, three top line numbers. One is um, in relation to brand and reputation, but there's a hundred numbers underneath that leading and lagging. Um, one is in relation to my ability to drive demand and revenue in our unmanaged customers, so that long tail of SMB customers. Uh, and the other one is how we're having a positive impact on, you know, on, on, on cross-selling, upselling, and accelerating pipeline into our managed accounts and enabling our sellers. So I won't bore you with all the metrics and, you know, um, you know Microsoft has its own internal acronym dictionary. That's how many acronyms we have, uh, which is called MAD, the Microsoft Acronym, Ac acronym uh, Dictionary. So someone with a good sense of humor <laughs> who, named, who named it. Um, there, there are hundreds of lead, leading and lagging, but there are, you know, when I say to my um, uh, team, I want you to, you know, think about success through this brand and reputation metric, this ability for us to scale cost effectively and drive uh, acquisition of customers in revenue in the SMB space and our ability to complement uh, the sellers in our managed account. And there's a, a, you know, a metric similar to what Christoph described you know, earlier in there, which is a very sophisticated machine learning driven engagement metric, which highlights the propensity for a set of behaviors account wide 360 across a customer that identifies the propensity of that set of behaviors, uh, the likelihood to drive a revenue outcome based on other organizations who have behaved that way with us. And, and that's really fine tuned and incredibly sophisticated now uh, to the extent that um, my business are happy to accept that score as ROI because the tangible link to revenue and customer ads uh, is so statistically significant, it's beyond any, any conversation um, right now. Uh, in terms of justifying ROI on the tech investment, there are so many lenses you can look at this through. One is obviously revenue, one is obviously acquisition uh, of customers, one is lifetime value and all those other, other great things. But I think the one that's often most underestimated is the customer experience, i.e. if you bill a customer from one database, track their, or, or do a contract on your from one database, build them from another database, have a separate marketing database, and then some kind of CRM instance your sellers are working at, and all four of those mechanisms have the ability to communicate with your customer. It's a horrible experience. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the, there's a lot of obvious ROIs, like, like, like the revenue and, um, you know, some operational efficiencies. Um, but I think you've got to bring it back to uh, two things, the customer experience and the commercial outcomes you're trying to drive. And if you can keep your eyes on, on those two, it doesn't allow you to get through the clutter of the MarTech that I think uh, that Rika mentioned earlier on. It's a very complex, um, you know, space at the moment. There's, everyone's got cool tech. There's tons of cool tech out there. Uh, and I think one of the great learnings for us over the last three, four years is keep ourselves anchored on the commercial outcome we're going to drive, then work back and find the tech rather than get really excited about some snazzy tech and figure out how to, how to embed it in. So that's been one of our big lessons in the last in the last few years. Um, and, and the final point I would say, and my, my team will laugh if they heard me say it, I say it all the time, marketing metrics for marketeers, commercial metrics for the commercial business. There are things we need to look at as marketeers that are really important to us. If you stand in front of a sales leader and talk about bounce rates or dwell time uh, or views or likes, they're going to say, have you seen my number go away? Uh, and so, you know, there's a, we have a very clear view on what's marketing speak and what's commercial speak. So ensuring you're gluing a commercial data set back into the commercial part of your business and your marketeers are holding themselves accountable to a marketing data set is something else that we're also kind of, you know, really, we keep ourselves true to. Thank you, Paul. Anyone got any other views or differing views from what Paul said? I think I'd just echo that, but, but maybe, maybe add to it, which is, I think you asked the question around how do you prove the ROI of marketing technology? And, and I don't think that's I, I don't think that's maybe the right question to ask because marketing technology, I think, is always an enabler of what we do. It should be making it easier for us to execute, easier and better for us to engage with with our customers. As Paul said, if it, if, if it ultimately were measured on how good is the client experience that we're delivering, joining up, particularly in big organizations, what is often a very siloed fractional execution that need, we need to make better across the board and actually making our business more more successful. If they're the two kind of things that ultimately we're trying to do, marketing technology should be enabling that rather than us saying, what is the ROI on an investment in a site called websites or in an Adobe digital asset management platform? I just, that's probably the wrong question to be asking. We should be asking, what is the return on investment of the marketing program in entirety, of which our job is to figure out the enablers of doing that, whether that's people and skills that we need or technologies that make our people's lives easier to, to, to execute those commercial and client experience objectives. Yeah, so I'd, I'd probably you. ask the question a different way, Moki. Okay, thank you, thank you Ruth. Um, what I want to do is uh, now go on to digital skills because um, you know, I do want to have some time for, for, for further questions from uh, the people who've, who've signed in. So I'm going to ask each of you a question and if you can you know, respond. Uh, so first one is to you, Ruth. Uh, what digital skill gaps has the pandemic created in your industry and and how have you bridged that digital skills gap in your organisation? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe be a slightly more controversial in terms of I'm not seeing digital skill gaps. What I'm seeing is the ability to join siloed digital skills from a client perspective and a client experience perspective. So I think we're all investing in developing um, the skills that we need and those you know, great skill sets coming into the market that have got deep domain expertise in certain platforms and, 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 and areas. Where I'm seeing there's a gap is actually what I call core marketing skill. So that ability to see things from a client's perspective, you know, ability to join the dots in terms of what is, you know, what is the end to end experience across all the different touch points and and bring that lens. Because it's like we've got so much data now. We're drowning in the data and we're, we're, we're failing to ask the right questions of the data to, to get the answers that we need. So I think it's it's some of those business business skills and and quite traditional marketing skills that I think we're beginning to see a shortage of. Thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, what future digital skills are you predicting is a must have for, for marketeers and, and in marketing? Yeah, I think it was a couple of things. One is there was a really nice piece of work um, that Microsoft did. Um, probably we launched it about nine months ago with a commitment to train one and a half million people in the UK with, with digital skills for a couple of reasons. One is um, we did a lot of work alongside our colleagues at LinkedIn to understand where the skills shortages are. So fundamentally looking at the data, what are the roles being posted? Um, what are the roles being filled? Uh, you know, what are the roles most in demand? And, you know, probably most people on the call wouldn't be surprised to learn that software developer is 
is, is right up there. Um, that's 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 a pretty hot market at the moment. Um, but it's a great piece of work. I encourage you to go and take a look at it. Where you know we work with Goldsmith University, and it's around creating a blueprint for UK competitiveness. And in there, it talks about the skills gap. The program's called Get On 2021 because that was the year we launched it in. But if you if you um, if you search for that, you will find um, how we think about that all up from a UK perspective, but also taking some accountability from our side because we're creating some of the technology that will be displacing roles that we discussed earlier on, and we're not kind of wearing rose tinted glasses and pretending that that isn't the case. And so a large part of that commitment is ensuring, you know, that we as an organization are recognizing um, not only the gap and the skills gap, but also recognizing the fact that technology is is displacing some of those skills. If I look at it from my perspective, um, I would say, you know, the, the biggest challenge, and maybe I'll step back and think about it through a kind of maybe a modern marketing lens, if that's even a, a thing, um, is to uh, you know data science data data science uh, capability, um, code writing capability, uh, people um, who are operationally brilliant. Um, it, it's I'm fortunate. I work for Microsoft. I could I get lots of very talented creative marketeers and brand people. You know, kind of you know, gravitate towards towards the work we're doing. That's not been my problem. My problem has been operations processes and data. So how do you get the I guess the the the, the backbone of the work we're doing in place, um, and that that's been that's been trickier uh, for us. So, software developer, um, you know, uh, data scientists, and people who view marketing ops as a as a discipline, and it is, by the way, and it's an amazing job. Um, uh, those have been the three areas we've probably um, you know struggled most with from a from a kind of hiring capacity. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, Rika, this is this for you as a CMO of one of the uh, world's largest uh, advertising agencies. Uh, I'd love to know what your clients' top digital skills priorities are. Well, well, they're mine as well as my clients. Um, so just <laughs> right. Um, and I think um, two things. I, I do not. I don't want us to distinguish between digital and analog. That's the first thing. Even when you talk skill sets, yeah, the generations that we are looking at, even ourselves, do not have that distinction anymore. And I think we segment unintentionally by doing it. Uh, and I, you know, that really, I think, so one thing, being truly customer focused and really understanding the customer experience is, is, is something that, that I do think we should focus on. And I do think that we should hire against or sort of look at what we need in terms to sort of make the most of that. Uh, and for me, that really means about breaking silos more than anything. It means breaking silos in how we operate and how we think. And it's very much about adding people to the mix who have broader skill sets, who have done more and more and not just have done sort of vertical training in one subject. I love to look at people that have, you know, experienced different areas of a customer experience, go, how can you add to that? So that, that's one thing, um, because that will allow us to create high performing teams. And I think that it is not individual skill sets, but it is, should be about high performing teams as well that can, you know, be truly diverse and cross-functional. I think cross-functionality in organizations are really important. Um, so, and that's why the broader sort of skill set comes into play um, so that we're more agile. Um, what is really though apparent is prioritize your data. I'm agreeing with Paul, prioritize your data, not only the series and the ones, but prioritize your insights, your how you analyze that data, how you talk about, you know, how you use that data usefully. Um, so so data, data is, is, is definitely a priority that I, both from an agency and the people that I have, um, will promote and prioritize. And I would also advise my clients to do the same. Uh, thank you, Rika. Um, and, and to you, Christoph, because obviously, you know, you, you're looking at the skills gap and looking at hiring. So how would you ensure diversity in your hiring to gain those necessary skills uh, that you need in your team? Yeah, that, that's a good uh, question, uh, 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 Moki, because um, I, I'd like to start with the answer with a psychology principle, which is when you create rapport to someone, uh, the underlying principle of mirroring uh, plays an important part. You love, they, they love, and you, know, you build bondage. Well, how does it mean, uh, how does it relate to the whole marketing and hiring process? You have to first of all see what's your client universe like? What are their skill sets? What's their expectation level? It, you need to mirror the diversity of your clients. 
not only geographically when you're a global organization like like we are because you need to cater for cultural differences in, in the way people process information but also in your own team it's you can compare this with a, a michelin star chef kitchen where you have somebody who you know uh, uh, peels the onion and cleans you know all the ingredients a sous chef who will make everything happen and then you've got the ultimate chef who's then basically saying oh here a little bit and there a little bit and out it goes and you know on that conveyor belt so you you need to have age diversity in terms of uh, what kind of skills do you want to internalize i spoke about content marketing i've internalized journalist and it's not just an easy thing to say oh well let's a journalist start in a marketing function because they are journalists they're not marketeers but you need to bring them on the journey and that's why when you when you hire again uh, think about that mind prison um, it's important to have a robust and very well trained marketeer that's why the CIM is such an amazing organization fostering the knowledge fostering uh, the skill set uh, next to that, you need to see what kind of industry knowledge do you need in your team? What kind of technology knowledge? So, Paul, if I would do a next hire, I would actually sort of link up with you and say, Paul, what what is the, you know, what's the, the person that I would need in my team? So ask the question uh, and get lateral hires from, from places you wouldn't expect. And lastly, you know, think about what's, what's needed for which, uh, for, for for which function. For instance, with us, when we are talking about content marketing, there's a lot of experience needed. I've recently hired uh, a person who's over 60, who, you know, has the benefit of ample time, no kids to look after, you know, no career ambitions that you get them out of the door in two years' time. So you think about for which purpose do you need which capabilities? And that's the right diversity you have, and that's why I am more excited and positive than ever before, given the fact that in the past I was my hiring was basically I'm sitting in London, but I you know London was my home turf. Now I can hire from India, from everywhere, and not just for my regional role, because you know future of work is those people and those roles who can work from home all the time. Be my guest. So let's really think about that creatively too, and use technology. No, uh, yeah, thank you, I, would, I, I was also Stop. just going to add that, of course, you can partner. You know, I, 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 you know, you, the best, I don't think the best creative brains in the world sit working on one brand for their entire career. I think they go and work in large agencies where they get to work on the world's, the world's greatest brand. So I also think there's a really important thing here. You know, I've got what, 35 full time employees um, and everything else I partner on. And some of those are five person agencies and some of those are global agencies. But I hired the 35 people that I believe give me competitive differentiation um, into roles that I think are sustainable and meaningful um, and everything else I utilize you know agencies and, and external experts and contractors for so that's the other thing is you don't have to have all the skills you need you can't afford all the skills and by the way some of the greatest skills don't want to sit in one company they want to go and experience multiple projects so you need to think as, as well around the kind of you know your partnering you know, methodology to augment your your full time employees or your in house team, whatever whatever phrase you'd use. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Just before we go on to the the questions from uh, uh, the people who've who've logged in, uh, I just want a, a, a brief, quick uh, sentences from each of you, just on because obviously we are marketeers, and you know this technology is, is scientific. But how do we balance that science and that creativity? within the team and within our organization. So very, very briefly. So Paul, I've got you on, on screen first. You wanna go first on that one? Uh, yeah, happy to. Listen, it makes life really hard. It, you know, modern marketing is now part part, part science. Uh, you know, that, that, that means building and leading and managing these teams are, are trickier, you know, than it's ever been. Um, but I truly believe that, you know, when you think about, you know, diversity of team, and I'm thinking more through a neurodiversity lens right now that, you know, the best marketing teams I interact with now are part, are part science and are very comfortable with how they interact and interoperate with one another, you know, and, and, and the role they play. Um, so I think increasingly, you know, great leadership makes it feel very complementary and natural. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and I think that, you know, a lot of what Christoph said that, you know, that we are marketeers, but we are increasingly commercial animals. Um, and I increasingly have people in my team from, you know, sales operations backgrounds and different backgrounds to really bring the commercial reality of, of, of what we need to do for our business into, into that group. Um, and if you can get that blend right where the data can validate, 
you know, the creative uh, or otherwise, and, and teams are willing to, you know, you have an open, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of supportive environment where those conversations flow. That that's the art of today's marketing leader, and it is part art, part science. And there's more commerciality on this CMO panel than I think there would have been on any CMO panel 20 years ago when you when 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 you did this. So it's changing, and you know, my advice is embrace it. Um, you know, find the right ingredients for your for your organization. It's um it's a really exciting time to be a marketeer. Thank you, uh, Christoph. <laughs> Well, I would say provide uh, people with the opportunity for training. That's why, again, I reference uh, CIM. And I would always say teach the creatives some science. So what science in like you know, data management, my, my editors need to know how to, uh, to, to compose a, uh, a, a newsletter in the technology. Uh, so they need to learn that. And so teach the creative science and teach those people who come in from a sort of more data analytics field give them the ability to be creative so that they can use their skills as well. So you, you don't suddenly have two factions in your marketing team, the one that just of, on the left-hand side of the brain and the other on the other, just teach both skills and make sure that you provide opportunities for lateral movements to create job satisfaction so that when the handshake with you and your team member loses, they're not pigeonholed to just be the social media a- analyst they are full-blown marketeers and, as Paul said, uh, uh, good managers of external relationships with a specific speciality. So that would be my, my biggest advice. Mm. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, Ruth? I, I think I'd just say three things, really, that are really important for us now with skills. The, the, the first is we have to be the voice of the customer in, in our business. And we've heard talked a lot about there's been this seismic shift because of COVID in terms of how customer behavior has changed. Uber digital now, you know, embracing change. Second, I think it's really important that we are really, we stay very connected to our business and, and the need for our businesses to be sustainable in the future, whether that's profitable or responsible. And, and again, that's changing. But we can't lose sight of what our business does. The third thing, and I think this is what we've talked a lot about today, is we have to be digitally literate and how we each invest in ourselves, but also our teams in terms of that digital literacy. Some countries are doing a really good job of making sure the whole population is digitally literate. Singapore is a great example to go look at. They've fundamentally put digital literacy in the same category into schooling as maths and, and, and core education. UK is not there yet, and I think Chris and the team at the CIM have got a role to do in influencing that. Um, but they're, they're the three things I think is really important that we stay focused on in terms of skills. Thank you. Uh, Rika, your thoughts? Yep, really quickly, because there's three minutes left. Um, I don't think it's about balancing. I think it's about merging skills. You know, I don't think it's a weight scale of balance and who um, I think it's about merging skills. You know, um, it's really, again, I talk about breaking down silos and that's where that merger lies as well. So at MRM, for example, we will never start a piece of work without having both science and creativity um, from together from the get go. They might go in diverse routes in the process from ideation to creation. But I think the starting point of merging the skills rather than balancing them is important um, because that allows us for dynamic optimization within the process, not after, not before, but in the process of creation. So merging, merging skills rather than balance is, is what I would, um, what I'll end that with, yeah. No, I agree with you. And uh, I've been asking you questions uh, fr- from uh, people who've sent them in as we've been going along, but um, there's, there's a couple of questions that have, have really come through and uh, we touched upon uh, the metaverse, but I don't know who wants to take this question on is, can you trust an avatar? Who would like to take that one? Can you rephrase that? Uh, rephrase that. Can you trust an avatar? Yes, because obviously we talk about metaverse and it's coming through. It's like, how do we create that profile of personality and, and trust? Of course. I mean, the avatar is, is your digital personality. And do you trust a 3D person when you meet them and you trust them? When you meet them 2D, we are, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want to ask the question whether people trust me just because I'm talking to you now uh, on a 2D level. It's just another way of interacting that gives us more opportunities because we are interacting 
in the metaverse in a 3D digital world. While it's currently, you know, at this point in time, it's a 2D world that enhances uh, all the interactions. But it's not a question of trust. The question of trust is a fundamental question of what we do. And I would add and there will be different metaverses um, with different rules. Um, and potentially legislation, um, you know, around the technology as it emerges. So um, I would just encourage you to think about the environment that you're in. If it's a private metaverse, it's been built by your organization and it's sat behind your files and your active directory, it's going to be just fine. If you just randomly wander into a room in someone else's metaverse and give me credit card details, I'd, I'd encourage you not to. <laughs> no, uh, That's uh, cool. really good advice. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is very good advice, and uh, uh, we've clearly got you know uh, enough content and questions for for another session. But just one more question that's sort of coming through quite a lot is, what should an SME focus on? Because you know uh, we've got some great brands here and, and, and sectors, but what should an SME focus on? And uh, at that level, uh, who would like to answer that question? Yeah, oh, we do. At, sorry, go on. I was going to say, you know, I've spent most of my career working in smaller businesses. Um, I would say keep it simple, double down on platforms, don't try and build best of breed point of solution stuff, get your data cleaned, um, determine which roles you want in house and determine where you need support from a partner um, and pick your partners wisely. Um, you know, in, in today's sprawling business models, you know, you could be funding a, a competitor uh, as well. So pick, pick your partners wisely. It's a, it's a more of a strategic uh, decision that probably ever has been before. Um, if you look at the the kind of business models of, of some of the large tech firms, they touch a lot of industries now. So pick your partners wisely to make sure they're not competing with you the day after you've paid them the PO. And I think just to that, I totally agree, but play to your competitive advantage of being flexible and agile. I would do that. I would add that to your, your points, Paul, and that play to your competitive advantage in um, agility and flexibility. Yeah, and I'd add one, one other thing, which is just really focus on your customer. You know, just if you're clear who your customers are, love them, grow your business with them, that's the easiest thing to do. And then try and find other organizations that look like those customers you've got. You know, don't worry too much about the other stuff. Um, just really focus on being deeply relevant for your customer. Thank you. And building on what Hood said, use your customer for advocacy. There's no time better than nowadays in the SME business. Our customers have an active role in being your, your, your second marketeer team. Because if you build the customer advocacy, they're, they're talking about you. Nowadays, everybody, whether you buy uh, on a big platform, you, you, you check what are the reviews, what do things, you know, and not the, you know, uh, the, 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 the reviews that all of us hate because they're not relevant. But if you have a smaller customer base, use them to your advantage because that is your big advantage i love the sme business i come from a country that is known for having an amazing sme business uh, propping up uh, uh, our economy i wish this would be everywhere in the, in the same way and us marketeers play a big big role uh, on customer advocacy uh, thank you um Sadly, that's all we've got time for today. We have slightly overrun, but it's clear that we could quite easily have done another hour and uh, time has clearly flown. So uh, I just want a special thanks to um, all our panelists once again. So Christoph, Ruth, uh, Paul and Rika, you know, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to hear your perspective and get your expert insights. And uh, thank you for joining us. And, um, and I say to everybody else, hope you enjoyed the discussion and found the insights helpful and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.